talking about. Welcome to the subcommittee on land management of the Amherst Conservation Commission. It is 12.05, and this is Alex Horst speaking. Bruce Stedman is with us, Michelle Lobb, Aaron Jock, and Dave Zomack. And we have an agenda on the web, which we're going to proceed with. If we have any members of the public present, uh, Aaron, I can't see them. So would you let me know? Absolutely. Yep, we have we do have one member of the public, but if they raise their hand, I'll let you know. Okay. Good. So hello, Dave. Um, hello, everybody. Yep. So what I wanted to do this morning is postpone talking about priorities and do justice to uh, those who have done some work in the past that we haven't had time to cover. So Michelle did, has done some work, I think. Bruce has done some work. I've done some work. And if we could cover those items and um, start to get caught up, I really don't want to assign have people doing new work without covering what they've already done. And um, frankly, adding the should we have more question adds a layer of complexity um, that takes uh, some time and uh, be interesting to see how we're doing there. So I'd like to start, if I could, just because I have it handy, with the forestry um section which i modified and that went out on september 28 i can share my screen and bring it up and also if i could we'll finish up on part of the garden community that has to do with the rules i talked to angela this morning they don't have any rules posted and they're expecting to change them so i don't know whether what we're doing is useful to them or not so I feel like we should probably get done with that and move it on. They're going to open up registration for the community garden in 2024 in February, or first part of February. Is that okay with everybody? Uh, um, and frankly, I couldn't find, I wasn't sure that I was looking at Bruce's most recent work or Michelle's most recent work. So when we get to that, you'll have to help me out. Can you share my screen or can I share my screen, Erin? You should be able to share. If you have trouble, let me know. Yeah, okay, I can see the share. Okay, so I have open what I want to share. Can you see that? Yes. Should say forest management at the top. And then when I submitted it. So with your indulgence, I'll quickly go down through what I did here and highlight what I think is the biggest change that's worthy of some discussion. Uh, the rest of it is uh, editorial type stuff. So I'm not gonna read it. I'm just gonna go through the, the points that I changed. And that begins in the second line with five purposes. And uh, saying that the commission implements forest management for five purposes, salvage and ecological restoration. And I'll be honest, I'm not quite sure what ecological restoration is. Wildlife management, climate resilience was added. I'm not quite sure what climate resilience is, and I didn't try and define it education and recreation. Then I uh, added a line saying harvesting standing trees for firewood and timber is not a commission purpose for forest management. And that takes a different slant and that is the one change that I think is worthy of discussion. And we'll come back to it. 
Um, my reason is pretty simple, but I'll come back to it. The rest of it, uh, the few word changes, uh, individual word changes aren't really worth going through. Uh, it does say that we will prepare appropriate forest cutting plans for filing with the state to allow for a salvage of trees downed by high wind events and for harvesting trees to enhance wildlife habitat on conservation land. And that will get wrapped into our discussion about the sentence up there about um, commercial harvest not being a purpose. Uh, there is a section in here that was already written that says that we will not sell carbon credits. Uh, I didn't write that. I don't know the background. I left it. If you want to talk about it, we can. Um, since I changed, sent this out where it says because of the ecological value of wildlife, the commission will one favor and promote trees and shrubs that produce mast, hard mast and soft mast. I wrote legacy, legacy trees, meaning big trees. And then I realized later that we're not going to be planting trees as part of forest management in people's names. And I didn't realize that that's a meaning for legacy trees. So today I crossed it out. Uh, large white pines, um, they're really important for bears and large stands of unbroken canopies, which are important for certain species of birds, which I didn't go into, but that's the reason that's there. Uh, and leaving, standing, i uh, got to change here. Leaving standing dead trees that do not pose a safety risk to people or property. Um, dead trees are really good for wildlife. Uh, lots of things live in them. Lots of things depend on the on the critters that live in them. So um, unless a tree is on a trail and going to cause a safety risk for people walking by, I just wrote that we would favor leaving them. And the commission will maintain an inventory and map of the forest land. I don't know if there is an inventory now. Dave can probably shed some light on that. But I would like to see us inventory our forest. And then I listed giving a minimum of acreage stand type composition and the size of the stand with unbroken canopies. And that's it. Those are, that's all I did to that. And so I'd like to go back for discussion on the sentence that I, if people have any questions other than the sentence about commercial <laughs> harvest, please, uh, I'll stop so you can uh, proceed. Michelle. Thanks. I'm good with the, the, you know, not commercial harvest as part of our um, intent. I just had a question about salvage. Um, that can get sort of tricky sometimes and in in some cases abused. I'm not saying we're at great risk at that, but salvage can be, you know, like, um, well, say there's a bunch of downed trees. Do we want to leave them down as habitat? Because, you know, down wood is also very important for the ecology of forest. Or is there going, you know, an insect outbreak? Sometimes there's a big jump to salvage those trees under the assumption that it's going to stop an insect outbreak and almost that never is the case as in it doesn't stop the insect outbreak but i'm i guess on the west coast we're really careful about saying salvage because it can just lead to maybe things without um ecological intent and more of a taking the trees away so it's just like kind of a trigger word for me and i wanted to make sure that we're what what do we mean by salvage and what are the right circumstances to do it yeah. Um, anybody else have any comments on that? I'll I'll respond. But anybody else got any comments on that topic? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, it, by do you mean that the trees are still standing, or that they fell over in one of these events? I envisioned falling over. Yeah. I think. Um, it, yeah. I did mention causes for. Uh, you know, high wind events where we've got 
Right, I see that. A tangle of trees. <sighs> so I think, yeah, this is a good little discussion. I think um, I hear you, Michelle. Um, given, yeah, I mean, given the small nature, I mean, the number of acres we have, I mean, we're not talking thousands of acres here. We're not talking millions of acres. I think the commission, the town would have a whole lot more control over what, you know, what the purpose of a forest cut might be. I don't, I agree with you, Michelle. I don't see a lot of room for abuse, if you will. Uh, the one thing, one example I could think of was like, we do have a fair number of um, red pine stands on conservation land. So they are subject, and I'm not going to get it because I wasn't thinking of this. What is the root? They get a root. I believe it's an insect. Um, so, so yeah, like uh, pine bark beetle, or, yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, like, I could see where you could say, oh, that entire stand is dying because it spreads via roots, right? So, do we, for safety purposes, do we take down? I'm actually thinking of out actually behind my house in South Amherst, there's conservation land with red pine on it. So do we take down a decent amount? Do we salvage the red pine, get it out of there because it's going to become a safety issue, you know, and, and fall down on the trail and potentially hurt somebody, something like that. I don't know. I'm just shooting from the hip here. I wasn't really thinking through this much, but you know, that might be kind of a, Oh, you know, we, we need to, think about how much of this let's not just take down five let's take down right. you know 45 and be done with it because we have a, a a contractor in there or something like that so i don't know if that really fits where you were going michelle or your concern yeah i mean i, I feel like red pine sort of a different story because those are all i don't know if they're non-native but they're like planted and um yeah. um yeah so yeah, I guess it's just salvage also entails like some monetary, I think that word means some like monetary outcome. So mm -hmm. that was just my concern. I don't really have a big problem with it. I yeah. just wanted to make sure that um, we're all on the same page with it. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, to me, the salvage means that the trees would not have been cut, but for some event. And mm -hmm. there's lots of room for a decision okay. and management of it. So none of these purposes are defined gotcha. and like salvage is not defined none of them are defined <laughs> the, purpose, the the following sentence um put some sideboards on salvage um where the the, the town is not going to have um timber sales i don't think that the reason i put that in there is we have so little forest that the timber industry in Western Massachusetts is by no means dependent on, nor is it influenced by whatever the town of Amherst can contribute. And our forest looks pretty much like any other neighboring forest. And I think we have an opportunity to do something else with our forest land, that, which is probably not happening on neighboring forests. Mm -hmm. So, um that's why i wrote that i think bruce you have your hand up there too and i'm sorry bruce go ahead no no worries um unless i missed it towards the end i wonder if some da uh sometime down the road we're gonna want to look at the question of the balance about standing forest versus solar arrays um, I've tried to start looking into it. I, I read at least part of the report that um, Mass Audubon did with the Harvard Forest team. Um, I've, I'm trying to get my head around all the different pieces of uh, a pretty thorny question. And I don't know whether adding a section to this is a good idea or it should just be a, a whole separate thing. Um, I also wondered if there was an opportunity, by what mechanism, Dave and Aaron, could we have a conversation with our colleague um, who do, uh, is on the Solar Bylaw Committee and might 
be able to uh, help us think about this without it being something where it's um, the open meeting law is problematic in some way. So, where what is the question you're trying to address there, Bruce? Trying to figure out if there's something in those land use policy that should talk about the link between forest cutting and solar arrays. So, and maybe it's not the right place for it, but we have a, a town committee that's trying to write a solar bylaw. I don't feel like I know anything about where they are or what they've done. Um, and we have a conservation commissioner who goes to the, is part of that committee. So I was just trying to learn more before I suggest that we do something. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I have a thought on that, but I know Aaron's hand is up. So why don't you jump in there, Aaron, if if that's okay with you, Alex? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I just had a couple comments. Um, there was a Wildlands and Woodlands report, which recently came out. It's a regional report um, from the former director of the um, Harvard Forest, and it's a major push on um, public lands for uh, it's basically uh, um, advocating for wildlands, so a sort of minimal management strategies on on public space, public open space. So I just thought that might be an interesting thing for commissioners to refer to. Um, I was involved with the um, June 6, 2011 tornado when I worked in Sturbridge, and um, there was a huge um, salvage um Free for all that happened after that um, tornado hit, where by state agencies went in and basically clear cut all of the trees that came down during the tornado. And um, I think it was a little bit overboard. Um, but I will say one comment relative to that is that sometimes during those storm events, it does impact the flow of streams or the movement of water, which can cause flooding and impact neighbors. And so just to keep that in mind and or um, if we wanted to have a policy relative to if if an incident impacted water flow, that that would be considered an emergency because in some cases it can flood roads or cause problems with washouts and things. Um, I to Bruce's question as far as solar um, on conservation lands, I don't think that's going to be much of a, an issue because typically structures are not permitted on conservation lands, so um <clears throat> like lands that are acquired through article 97 or conservation through cpa um they're not going to be permitted to have structures on them um under under state law so i just wanted to mention that and that's all can i make a follow-up to aaron's um just so that helps me think about this document and this committee does that mean that we're only talking about forest policy on lands that the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction over? That's our jurisdiction. Okay. That, those are the sideboards. Okay, thank you. And that's, if I could, Alex, that's kind of where I was going, you know, uh, uh, prior to Aaron jumping in there is, is Bruce saying, I was kind of distinguishing between what the commission's policy regarding lands they have authority over versus the broader, you know, should we be cutting forests on private land in Amherst? That's something the commission certainly could weigh in on relative to the solar bylaw working groups um, draft uh, bylaw, which is coming out. It should be, if it's not out in the public yet, it should be out in the in the public uh, arena before the um, after Thanksgiving. Um, so certainly the commission could weigh in on that, and and I might encourage the commission to look at that. So, um, is that has that policy hit Paul Bachelman's desk yet? I don't know if it has yet or not, but it is soon. If if not, it will soon be turned over to Paul. So, could yeah. I make? Two other quick question, uh, comments on um, anything related to forest cutting and harvesting. Um, I just wanted to put it out there that in the past, one thing we have done, not extensively, but um, there have been situations 
where we have actually felled trees on Amherst conservation land and milled them and used them for bridges and boardwalks on Amherst conservation land, which I actually think is a really, frankly, a good use of, you know, this is a very small, you know, we didn't do, you know, a zillion board feet or anything, but I, I just wanted to put it out there that I do think that, you know, wood for boardwalks comes from somewhere, right? It has to be shipped. You buy a piece of wood at um, Home Depot, in all likelihood, it could have been milled in the U.S., shipped to China, and then shipped all the way back with the incredible markup, and you buy it again at Home Depot. So I do think this policy should allow for some flexibility there um, for some sort of modest harvesting by the town to um, to use uh, use that timber. I'm thinking of like uh, white oak, particularly white oak, red oak can be very good for boardwalks and things like that. The other thing I just wanted to put out there, not to complicate our lives, but we do have the black walnut trees at the Fort River Farm that were that I negotiated with the previous owner um, to leave at the Fort River Farm. And someday we have been gently managing those black uh, black walnut trees. And at some point down the future, uh, in the future, they will be worth a decent amount of money. And I think we ought to keep that, the opportunity to harvest those black walnut trees um, as a possibility for uh, income for the town and or the department. Yeah, and, given, given the size of those, I've just seen them from a distance. Yep. I doubt you'll be harvesting them in your lifetime. Uh, well, you never know. I, I have longevity in my family, Alex, but no, <laughs> you're talking, yeah, you're probably, yeah, 25 years from now, they could be worth a whole lot of money for the town. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, the other That's thing is I noticed, I guess this is the question for whoever wrote this or edited this. Um, we haven't talked at all about carbon credits and I noticed there's that one liner in there. Yeah. Could somebody comment on carbon credits Go ahead, and the pros and cons. I want to get back to uh, Dave's first question. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I, mean, I like that idea back to the harvesting for um, on site. So that's just my two cents real quick, because it is has a sustainability element to it. Mm -hmm. um, the carbon thing, and Aaron, I think Aaron was on the con con when this came up first. I think it was Fletcher and Laura who wanted to have add this. And I don't really know enough about it, but they were very um, cautious about considering this and seemed like it was, it, it was, it's a very fast developing market that isn't well regulated all the time. And um, anyway, they, they had a lot of caution, advise a lot of caution. I think maybe one of them put it in there. But Aaron, is that how, what you remember? Yeah, they brought it up. And then I did some research on the back end after <clears throat> the question was raised. And apparently what a lot of companies will do who need carbon credits, they'll contact cities and towns that have lands that are already preserved and try to purchase the carbon credits from them. And the concern there is that it's not really, they're not really purchasing the carbon credits because technically if they're purchasing purchasing the carbon credits they should be purchasing the land that's associated with the carbon credits um so it's kind of like a almost like a double dipping type situation um and i guess a lot of a lot of companies are capitalizing on that so that's that's kind of the the backstory of how it came up and some of the research i did on it um led to that conclusion mm -hmm. I just think we should do, I hear you on that, but I think we should do a little more research on that. I'm cautious, very cautious about them. Um, but what I have heard is that, for instance, you know, you, you uh, municipalities, land trusts have sold carbon credits to companies and then put that money back into land acquisition for a land trust or a municipality. So I think that achieves the the goal. Part of the goal is to protect more land. And uh, so 
anyway, I just like to look into carbon credits a little bit more. I'm very cautious about them. Don't get me wrong. I've heard and read some of the very same things as you, Aaron, and and others. So, uh, I and I know, yeah. I got, no, I, just, I, got I, I got Bruce. I support maybe reconsidering that if we can put um, boundaries on it, like it needs mm -hmm. to be used for additional land acquisition. Be because we're already saying here that we're not going to cut our forests, so it would seem like double dipping. So anyway, that's just where I stand. Gotcha. Thank you, Bruce. Um, we're going to look into it more. So never mind. Okay. A uh, comment about uh, carbon credits and selling them. When when I was working dealing with mitigation, we didn't favor people preserving land that already had good habitat on it because it already exists. And they wanted to buy that land, which had no threat and call it mitigation. We didn't like that. And in terms of buying carbon credits, that forest is already storing carbon. And by selling the carbon credit allows somebody else to pollute. So if we're going to reconsider it, let's consider what it actually does. Yeah, that was a lot of the backstory that, that I read as well. So going back to the white oak tree or the red oak tree for planks, um, there is a, uh, in the, up in the beginning, second sentence, it has the word recreation. So you could say that we manage conservation land parcels to meet uh, the objectives, one of which is recreation. So you could probably work your way into uh, cutting a tree to build a bridge. But to get equipment in there, to harvest the tree. I mean, I, I looked into cutting trees on my own property to build my own cabin because of the romance and glamor of the idea. And by the time I tried to do that, it was cheaper to buy it. But if you're going to go in and cut trees to saw them up for planks on a bridge, you have to have access. You have to uh, uh, get it to the mill. And so all of that, getting to the tree, getting it out, is part of the impact of cutting. And mm -hmm. if you're going to do that, um, all of that should go into whether or not to cut those trees to build bridges or, or saw planks. Um, uh, so what is the, what's the zone of influence? So that tree is right next to an existing road and you're going to take it out anyway, great. But no sense in building a quarter mile access road to get a few trees to help build bridges. No, we would never do that. But I'm thinking of Lawrence Swamp is where we did this. And there are many, there's a whole myriad of woods roads that are already in Lawrence Swamp. What we did actually in one case was we we did we did saw some timber um and some planks, but we also um we just felled um I think we felled some maples and we actually built a bridge, a simple bridge over a small stream with the the trees themselves we didn't even we didn't even cut them we didn't even saw them up we we harvested them right where they stood and then we uh basically dragged them uh and lifted them to the stream and installed a very simple uh crossing there so those are the kinds of situations yeah. i would just i i always like to add the word passive recreation into these does anybody have a problem with that because I just know future generations and current generations, when they read recreation in any conservation related thing, I I interpret that as, you know, could be active recreation. So I always like to passive to me says trails and hiking and running and not soccer fields and playgrounds and jungle gyms, but maybe that's my own background. Comments? Michelle, Bruce, Michelle. Bruce first, go um, just, I want to remind all ourselves, this is a policy document and we can, we should have language. It simply says that a commission would have to authorize any cutting plan for the conservation land. 
Did there have to be a full report outlining all the details of the stuff we've mentioned in this conversation? And, and try to keep it so we're not adding too much detail to the document. Michelle? Um, I just wanted to say that, can we add passive recreation to our um, word list, our glossary? And Aaron, are you taking notes on this or should I write that down or <laughs> what's our process? I do I do think we should specify it, but also just say what, what exactly it is. I don't have a problem with adding passive next to recreation, but it does. We don't describe education. We don't describe habitat management. We don't describe anything. Um, there aren't any adjectives. Well, we got ecological restoration. I don't have a problem with putting passive in, and I I like the idea of putting it in the glossary, and I can add a, a regulatory type sentence, uh, but I noticed that we're at thirty six minutes past the hour. And I do want to give uh, time to Michelle and Bruce, um, and I'm happy to to uh, move this along. If we can make the changes and come back, that might save time during this meeting. Comments? I, I feel like Alex has done really good work. We should have a clean version for the next time that has only the remaining questions that are, in his mind, still undecided i do think we should add a, a um terms defined terms page to the document but i think we should wait until the end and maybe go through and highlight those and add them one at a time um but i'm completely fine with adding those and i do kind of take notes during these meetings as well yeah um okay i i favor doing it as they come up that way you don't forget but that's a small point. Um, I can I can clean version. Um, this version was, you know, came out in August. Um, you'll notice that it has a date in the front. I I wanted to have a discussion on file naming because, frankly, I had trouble finding this. And I had to go back to the email that I sent it to Aaron in order to find it. But uh, that's a whole nother topic and I'm getting lost in the various versions. So, um, so far we have all comments, all changes preserved in what we're working on. And what Bruce has suggested is having a clean version to work from. I need- well, It feels like we've gotten far enough along on this one that we're ready for that change. Okay, so your comment was about forest management. For, the, for this section. Yeah, okay. I'm fine with that. Okay, um, if we're done with that, um, I'm, I want, we're halfway through and Michelle hasn't had a chance to say anything about her work, nor is Bruce. So I'm gonna cut off here and um, hand it over to either one who wants to go next? You can go ahead, Ruth. Okay. Um, can I, am I able to share my screen? You should be able to, Bruce. Yeah, there we go. Um, okay, we worked on this in a previous meeting. So this is general rules and regulations. I took, prior to the time we actually looked at it this way, I took the old one, I reorganized it, and then I left what I felt like I left a few questions. You can see that there's a, in this case, uh, I had a comment about what Michelle had done and I wasn't sure what it meant. Um, and I'm just gonna scroll down to show the structure. And then Alex and, and Aaron made a comment about designated trails. Um, we talked about having an appendix, a map in the appendix. In this section right here about watercraft, uh, there was a, a modestly long discussion, and this is my understanding of where we ended up, except for the mispronouncing of, I, that, that's wrong, canoes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then I think the only other thing that is still in here that we had last time, for some reason in my notes, I underlined this. 
And I don't know why I did that, but if someone can re, uh, can say whether they dislike it or like it, or we'll, we'll go from there. But that's sort of where we ended up. Um, so I believe we're pretty close to a revised version of this section that could be incorporated into a complete version that the commission could look at once we solve some of these little things. Yeah, there Sorry. was also comments about hunting. Hunting, let's see, where is the hunting bird? It's up above. Up above. Hunting, horses, hunting, fishing and hunting. Fishing and hunting. Yeah. So I made a comment, you might recall that given our definition of our mission, the first word is protect and hunting doesn't protect anything. So, um, and I also looked at where people can hunt. It's on the mass, the Amherst website identifies all kinds of places people can hunt. And there's a whole discussion to be had on where the boundaries are for Lawrence Swamp and uh, how does somebody know they're on one parcel and another? And, but anyways, my basic point was that hunting appears to be contrary to the mission that we state very early in this document. Remember we talked about catch and release fishing? And then Aaron commented that they'd have to, we'd have to post all the land where hunting is not permitted. But not all conservation land allows hunting, only certain parcels. And I don't know if the parcels where no hunting is allowed are posted. So you can go to the town website and look up where you can hunt. Uh, Holy Oak Range, well, it's not the entire range. It's only Amherst Conservation Area that we're talking about and so on. So that's a fairly complicated issue and something that warrants some discussion, I think, before we go back to the rest of the body. Okay. Is that, so for you, do you wanna put that on the agenda for the next time as a concentrated 15 minute discussion? Sure. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with that. Michelle, um, I think I think there's a, another thing that we should really take some time with, which is the dogs, the rules around dogs. I don't know if we reviewed it or if we kicked the can on that one. I kind of feel like we. I think the latter. Yeah. Um, just just my comment is that we might want to spend a little time on this section. Um, I don't know. Yeah, the hunting is anyway. That was. Kind of my own. I don't know where you want to start with it, but ready. Dave's initial, Dave's comment when we brought that up is, do we really want to bring that topic up? <laughs> well, could I jump we... in, Alex? I, I think, I think the dog conversation and the hunting conversation. I think, in my mind, this is, this is the time. This is the group and this is the time to bring these up and wrestle with them in depth because as you mentioned a second ago alex but you said before we bring it to the larger body so i think this is the this is the group this is the arena this is the space we need to really dig into these issues have robust conversations agree agree to disagree because I think once we bring them to the larger body, because ultimately this this policy needs to come to a vote, um, that's when the proverbial rubber hits the road or whatever. So, and dogs and hunting are really hot button issues in this town, but also in this valley. So um, I, I I agree, we, we should dig a little deeper on, on both of these. Um, I would just add, um, I agree with you, Alex, you know, looking at hunting and fishing, there's some interesting complexities there. Frankly, you you couldn't even be consistent with fishing unless you made it all catch and release, right? 
you you can't have a a put and take fishery as we do for instance at, at puffer's pond you we'd have to change that to put and uh, excuse me catch and release but um on dogs you know i quickly skimmed this and one thing that came to mind the last bullet dog handlers must bag and pick up their dog's feces blah 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 uh, it occurred to me that I'd like to have a deeper conversation. I'm not sure why we allow dog walkers and dog handlers. They're essentially profiting by using this public space. And so I don't know that that's an intriguing, you know, dog walkers. We have some of the most intense and consistent problems with dog walkers uh, on town conservation land. So it occurs to me like, hmm, I'd love to have that conversation in a deeper way. Anyway, I'll stop there, but I agree I with suggest, Michelle. Can I suggest that we have an entire hour on dogs and we'll probably sure. just probably eat up a better part of an hour on hunting. And I, okay. um, Dave, just so that you know, I did get on the web and looked up the maps for every single place where hunting is allowed. And I don't know if the boundaries are flagged in the woods, whether I would know when I'm on uh, swampland uh, or those categories of forest that are right right next to it. And, you know, if somebody's going to, uh, there's a, from from a public standpoint, there's a huge difference between somebody bow hunting, which is quiet, and somebody using a black powder rifle, which is allowed in Massachusetts, within 500 feet of a residence, I think people would go ballistic if they had somebody in a deer stand within 500 feet of their house blasting away at dawn. Um, oh, so that's just part of that discussion. Yeah, it's complex. Well, we should spend an hour on it. Yeah. I don't want to, I want to. I've done enough for this for right now, I think. And let's go to Michelle so that we know yep. by yeah. the end of the hour where we all are. We're catching up. We're catching up. Yeah. We're gonna Can I just ask a question back to watercraft? Because <laughs> um, I, I got confused re reading this. But just to clarify, Bruce, do you think you could just scroll up to it? Is, water, is motorized boats allowed anywhere? Like, I'm just wondering why we're specifying two places like it kind of leads me to be like well where can i bring a motorized boat should we just have a period there or are there actual places where you could have motorized boat motorized watercraft um, well, this is just where we ended up after the last conversation okay well if you want to scratch the places it might just as long as that's actually what we mean well i'll just leave it in for now we'll come back like that and then we'll come back to it okay and I think, Dave, to your point about the professional dog walkers, I've seen like limits on number of dogs. And if they are over that, maybe sometimes they need a permit or it's just not allowed. But mm. I can maybe just do some Googling and see what other places do. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Yeah, it just struck me that you have a commercial venture yeah using our and and we generally frown on commercial ventures using public land so do we do we have professional dog walkers in town yes we do I do. a lot of dogs in this town <laughs> and they actually come to amherst conservation land from other towns as far away as brattleboro vermont wow really? there is one dog walker who is lives in brattleboro but their business is Amherst based and they have been observed walking five to seven dogs at once off and on leash. So yeah, very consistently. So yeah, more on that. Okay. Well, we'll have a, um, I'm withdrawing my sharing. Yeah. Michelle, um, you let's hear uh, about the work that you did. If you're ready, you're on mute. I don't have anything ready to put on my screen. Do you have a version with my edits that you could put up? That would have to be Aaron. Okay. Uh, 
I can look. What was your topic? I think Somebody it was their research on public lands. Yeah, I think you've covered that before. Okay, well then, I don't know. <laughs> it's been a while since we, we revisited this. So um, was there somebody going to cover agriculture? Bruce, was that you? I, I haven't started. Okay, that's been a couple of weeks. Um, and well, then, Michelle, you had another topic. Yeah, so I, I could ask questions for guidance because that is something I wanted to do. So my, my big topic was like uh, managing like for climate change and sustainability. And I had a couple ideas. So um, one is I found a list in the open space and management plan of all of our properties. And um, I've asked some biologists for advice on how to approach this, but I think having some kind of, uh, not necessarily a database, but just a table of what habitats we have and what species are present might be useful and sort of guiding where our efforts could be. And then like for sensitive species, um, looking into their recommended, like state recommended climate management criteria or habitat management criteria. So that was my idea. And before I dove down into it, which I could do this Thanksgiving break, I just wanted to know if that's a worthwhile thing. And if so, like what kind of columns would you guys think would be useful to have on this table with the associated properties that Amherst holds. Are you talking plants? Hold on, Bruce. Are you talking I'm, plants? I'm plants? like more like forest, early successional grassland, and maybe, you know, like, is it mowed or like, you know, it does it have public trails? Is it, what's the purpose? Is it for wetland? There's no public access. I mean, watershed, is there no public access? like some basic criteria to sort of get a sense of what we're even talking about managing. Cause, cause that's something I feel like I need to see before I dive down, like what to do. Okay, Bruce. I withdraw my remarks earlier. I'm, I have a whole agricultural thing that's gone through a couple of meetings and I could show it now or save it to the next time. Okay, Dave. Um, I'm just commenting, uh, responding to um, Michelle, and, I, and I'm curious if Aaron wanted to weigh in. So I guess my first response, Michelle, is yes, I think we need, we have never had that in my tenure, nor the tenure of the previous conservation director. Have we really had that level of detailed approach to land management Clearly, 20, 30, 40 years ago, climate change was not where it is today on our horizon and one of our one of our layers of consideration. Um, but as you were speaking, I was thinking, now again, um, cost, time, resources are are everybody's concern here. We don't we we don't have, you know, we 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 don't have unlimited resources. So how do we get to that? level of information that we need to guide us moving forward. So I, I started to think about, well, what are those, you know, what is the natural heritage information that we have on Amherst and the land that we that we uh, manage and adjacent land? So rare and endangered species information, obviously with that climate resiliency lens, uh, you mentioned the habitat types that we currently manage for and really, we don't do any forest management to speak of. So it's mainly early successional uh, habitat. And then thinking of like other layers that we can mine from biomap, uh, uh, what is it, uh, CAPS, right? Um, you know, for Scott Jackson's work and all of that to really say, okay, where are those special places in Amherst? Because it's not all special, right? Alex, you said this earlier. A lot of it is just, hey, we got a lot of that. We got a lot of that. It's kind of like that, you know, um, but there are rare and endangered species in Amherst and many of them may be the first ones to be in trouble. Maybe they already are. Uh, I, I'm thinking terrestrial turtles as a great example. Where are they? Where are those? Where are our box turtles? Where are our wood turtles, roughly speaking, you know, um, and how are we managing those fields and forests where those two species occur, because they are terrestrial, they are impacted by trails, other activity, 
mowing and all that. And again, there's many other species besides terrestrial turtles and our, our plants, uh, et cetera. So anyway, I think it's a great, a great way to to go. And I would welcome your investigation with folks in the field. Sure, I can start that. And one other idea I had about tying into this is if we knew some kind of acreage or general acreage for what is mode, there's definitely ways to sort of figure out carbon emissions from certain like vehicles, mowers, and you could get a very rough idea of what is happening right now and how much we could dial it back and sort of like get a you know carbon emission savings just from small small changes in the management regime for certain fields and stuff. So that, we, that we can do that on GIS. We can figure out how many how many fields we mow. We don't mow them all annually, but we know how many we are trying to mow, um, and then we can. Um, uh, tease out, like you said, the the carbon usage on diesel and gas. Yeah, it would be kind of a cool contribution to the town's climate initiatives and goals, I thought. But anyway, I just wanted to like open this up if you guys had any ideas about what components to include in this kind of um, summary. So there's my idea. So just the general comment, hold on, Bruce, I'll get right to you. But if you're going to, I asked you, are you talking plants? as opposed to plants and animals. If you're gonna do plants and animals, you will never finish. Well, I'm not gonna do specific Huge plants, job. just habitat types. So like, you know, early successional or like, you know, young meadow, wet meadow, wetlands, like general standard habitat types. Okay, Bruce. And, and special status plants and animals. That's it, that's how I would do it. Cause yes, I, it would have to be manageable for sure. So something to look into, maybe it would be helpful. I know that the University of New Hampshire has a sustainability internship program where people, someone might um, want to be able to come and, and gather all this information for us uh, by working with the town uh, databases and such. But we can look into that offline. Would you so, like, Michelle, would you... Uh... In the forestry thing, the last sentence has to do with creating an inventory. And um, I don't know if there's any kind of an inventory for our habitat types now. I, I suspect not. But uh, could that be done with just off of GIS, Dave? I would I defer to Aaron and Michelle on that. that. Yeah, I can do that. Um... It's it's a rough, you know, I don't know what the resolution is, but that's not too difficult. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's always more difficult than I think it's <laughs> but, uh, Every, Everything takes three times longer than you think. I, I guess it's, yeah, I could talk to Aaron about it. It's basically like what kind of data is available to work with. Like if we have polygons of all of the, the properties and I mean, I, yeah, I'd have to put some thought in it. But in theory, I'd like to have some sense of... Um, what the habitats are and how many acres we have to manage or hold, like how much forest do we actually have? And like, what does that represent Amherst? And that's sort of the vague outline. And maybe, you know, if I get this done, I could send sort of a draft so you can see what I'm talking about. Just maybe do a couple properties and I can have a sense of what the undertaking is and maybe how useful, like what useful components it would be. So the, the, the GIS folks can probably put the layers on to isolate uh, conservation land and help you out um, in defining those properties and do it fairly quickly. Well, well, we already have all the the properties defined, and Aaron is a GIS expert. So, Aaron, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how like sort of granular you want to get with this um i've sort of envisioned that you're talking more landscape scale but like um i think what would be really helpful is for example michelle if you wanted to like sift through the mass gis layers and say these are the layers that i think would provide the most necessary information to do this analysis and then um, I can check in. We have a we have a GIS coordinator for the town. So, you know, there's the potential that we could get those layers downloaded and actually like clip those layers to our conservation lands so that we could 
get, I mean, there, there are ways to do this that are not manual, right? There, there, you know, we can use the existing data to sort of extract what we're looking for. Um, and, and if we did that, then it would be something that maybe Mike Warner, our GIS coordinator could do. I just want to, like, I would love for the, Michelle, if you want to take it on, absolutely. If you have limited time and you want like some backup support, that's also an option. So I just want to make sure that you know that we're here to, you know, provide that backup support. If there are ways you can guide what you're looking for, um, just let me know and we can try to get that together for you. Great. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to bring it to the group and then I'm going to like do something very quickly to get a sense of what the, what it would take and what Aaron says is what kind of data layers I want. And then maybe I'll just come back with um, a better understanding next time of what this is and something to show you. I do have to go though, but yeah. Um, any... Well, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. <laughs> Try. <laughs> it still has to be usable. Um, <laughs> um, so we're out of time. And Aaron, can you tell us when our next meeting is? Yes. Um, and then before we go, I just want to have an idea of what we're going to do. We've got several suggestions on how to use time. And we've got uh, items that we've all worked on that haven't been finished in terms of our review. Well, so we, we would ordinarily be on for the 5th and 19th of December, but I have them whited out on my calendar for some reason, which I don't know if we had previously canceled those or decided not to meet in December or. Um, I can do them. Um, okay. I do have to go. So is there um, a way that I can. Can just... we do the 5th? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we're yeah. going to meet on the 5th. And uh, just real quick, um, I would like to get caught up on things that people have already worked on before we dive into dogs and before we dive into. Uh... I'll have agriculture. Okay. Okay. Talk agriculture. So agriculture, we're going to hear from Michelle with something and we'll get back to community gardens. Okay. Great. All right. Nice to see you guys. Thank happy. you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Happy, th happy Thanksgiving. Yes, you indeed. Too. Thank you. Feel better, Michelle. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.